আমি বলি দেবাঞ্জন ওভার টু ইউ Thank you very much. Can I just request the audience to settle down a bit? It's been a brilliant session that preceded us, and I can well imagine the excitement. Um, before I kick off this session, can I just get a sense of how many of you here have read the novels and have questions that you would like to put to the authors? So this will help me structure the session. a little bit appropriately some of you have okay um first i would like to kick off with a huge round of thanks to um the team that puts this festival together malavika banerji and her team at um uh, uh game plan i think this is a festival that uh, we here in kolkata are very very proud of it's put kolkata Uh, on the literary map if it needed to be put on the literary map of the world again and i think the sessions are brilliantly curated and one evidence of that is this particular session that balubika has put together where she has brought two debut novelists together but there's so much in common uh, and obviously there's a lot in a lot that differs as well but just a uh, tribute to how well curated the sessions at uh tata steel kolkata literary meet are um uh i have with me um onindita ghosh and shomo bhattacharya uh two um debut novelists and uh, their novels are absolutely brilliant and i really urge those of you who haven't uh read it or have not yet purchased it please go out and get these novels this is shomo's novel and this is onnita's novel uh both are available in the bookstore uh, outside what is uh, quite compelling uh, uh, about both novels uh, i felt um there, there are three things i think that kind of connects um the two of you and and the narratives that you've uh, written uh, i think the first thing is a relationships are at the heart of both novels and particularly um uh, relationships between parents and children uh in your case on it's about the focus is very much on the mother daughter relationship shomo in your case it's a focus on uh, father daughter relationship the second thing that i found quite interesting uh that's common to both narratives is that the the narratives are birthed by death as it were so death or deaths in plural um so we'll talk about that a little bit if possible and uh the third thing is extraneous to the world of fiction but to your real lives both of you have been uh, or are journalists and journalists i immensely admire uh, and your non fiction writing is something that i've been following for a very long time uh, shomo we launched your first book of non fiction together at the british council um so um there are a lot of commonalities well, so this one too as a matter of fact this one too at right. uh, oxford bookstore right yeah um so uh the first question i would like to put to a couple of questions for common to both of you is um the choice of uh the form uh so uh, if i may start with you shomo you have chosen uh, a relatively conventional epistolary form the first person narrative but it does pack in a number of surprises and it adds layers that i felt is not that common to that framework uh, would you like to comment on that so well it isn't uh, really a conventional epistolary novel in the way we know what an epistolary novel is or the way we define an epistolary novel i think uh, what i was trying to do here was to use the epistolary form as a sort of framing device and the narrator tells the story of his life to his daughter in what he calls are a series of letters but they are actually only dispatches from the front line of his life 
and what he is hoping slyly secretly because there's a if you come to the end there's a reference to him printing it off what font he uses leading times new roman double spaced and he prints the whole thing off and he wants to send it off to an agent so what he is secretly slyly hoping for is this becomes a book which actually becomes the book that you're holding in your hand so there's it's a kind of meta fictional play going on there um onindita uh, about your choice of the narrative uh, device i mean what what would you like to share with us here and what what compelled those choice choice or choices that you made um so you know i think the book is uh, more popularly described as a book about a mother and daughter but i do believe it's a book about i mean there's a constellation of women in the book yeah. but since the primary characters are mother and daughter and i kind of wanted each to have their own you know narrative environment uh, it's alternating chapters uh, by the mother and daughter i also have these posters which i was very excited yeah. about uh, because there is a right wing uh, vigilante political group called mss and i kind of didn't want to waste too much uh, you know fictional space or narrative space talking about them so i thought just having their posters in various stages of articulation would be a good way to show them and um, i feel as writers of course we read a lot and some things uh, distill into your consciousness and i was reading rachel uh, kushner's mars room at the time when i was working at the book and i think that's one of the things you wanted to speak about like it's so you have to be so careful about your creative nutrition while you're writing because you don't want to be swayed you don't want to be influenced sometimes you're terrified of reading other new books right but uh, i i do believe we need to read so and she's an author i admire and her book is set in this california women's uh, prison system and she had this one page of rules of dressing in the prison she just had one page but i really liked it and i think that kind of made its way as posters in my book yeah um that's a very interesting thing you touched upon on indita that um your consciousness of reading other writers and in both your novels um they are very writerly texts to quote bart and lot of writers past present uh, make guest appearances in both the novels so um is there an anxiety of influence uh, would you like to expand on that and then shoma would like to come to you with the same question because you deal with very different galaxies of authors but they are very very present in that sense so i have three very overt references the first line of the book is an homage to virginia wolf the simone de beauvoir and audre lord and i think they are such stalwarts that you cannot be embarrassed or afraid of even quoting them of course it would be terrible to be influenced by other contemporary writers but i kind of this is my first book and i they've they've been very influential and i kind of wanted to i don't know just put them in somewhere uh, yeah show me about what about the writers that pepper your narrative they pepper my narrative because the narrator wants to be a writer and as uh, susan sontag once said before we become writers we are readers and therefore by being readers we belong to the community of literature so because he is an aspiring writer though of course he does never become one alas uh these are the figures in his pantheon and these are the figures that stimulate him inspire him and th- th- his consciousness as a writer even as an individual as a human being is heavily colored by the presence of the pantheon some of them dead some of them alive some of them dead when the novel first came out uh some of them alive when the novel first came out and now dead but they are is huge unspoken influence that he looks up to and wants to in some way to emulate um this other thing about uh your um novel shomo that is uh as a reader um i found interesting and uh, and slightly disturbing as well um which is um 
there's almost a sense of, um, I'm, I'm struggling for the right word here, uh, 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 fear of being a writer or, or, or be almost being ashamed of being a writer. And I'm just reminded of uh, G.K. Chesterton who described uh, uh, writers as peddlers of words who are swapping ideas for money. Um, so um, is, and then you're also in a parallel life, you're a journalist, again, sort of using words uh, in, in other contexts. How does that uh, um, kind of sit with you within that, not, not with you, with, with, with your narrator um, within that? I mean, is, is, is that, you know, is you know, the line between that I in your book yeah. and you as an author, does that sort of blur somewhere? No, I think the, the two questions there, do you want me to uh, go for both? Answer both. Yeah, One both. being the fear of being a writer, being, being a writer. and fear also being the writer. shame. Yeah. I think the yeah. narrator is terrified that he will not make it, mm. and he doesn't. And the worse things get, the we more... We don't know. Uh, that I'll contest. We don't know whether he, he makes it or not. Well, at it's least, still, at least it's no? very ambivalent and yeah. deliberately so, but at least till the 200th page, we don't know that he has made it. So that, that's mm. how I would put it. So therefore, the worst things get in his life and he scratches away and he just can't come up with something, the more terrified he becomes. So that is the fear part of it. And the shame part of it that uh, you mentioned, and I think there's a scene when he uh, has to fill in a form at his daughter's school. Exactly. And there's yeah. uh, occupation and his daughter comes and asks, uh, what do you do? Yeah. The shame is that all he wants to put there is writer, but he can't because he isn't one. On the same question to you, and I'll come back to you on the second, gen second yeah. one. Yeah. So, you know, I have realized that women writers get asked more if their books are biographical. I've been speaking about this to other writers, and I think it comes from some a sense that uh, women can't write from a place of pure creativity, that they can only write about what they've experienced. But I realize that in my years as a journalist, I have also asked this question to writers. So I think it's, it's probably some kind of, you know, an innate curiosity. You want to know if something is real. But um, I was terrified that people would think that things were real or I, I needed to build these layers of distance because otherwise you can't, you can't go free. Uh, so Bombay is a city that I've lived in for most of my life. And I think just one of the things I did is that the book is not set in Bombay. It was just one physical detail that I could uh, avoid. And the book is set in so many cities. It's New Jersey, Dharamshala, Mysore, Delhi, Calcutta, uh, but not Bombay, which is a city I know most intimately. So I think as writers, uh, to be able to be free or to be able to kind of explore truth, you can't really be thinking about, are my parents going to read the sex scenes or, you know, are people going to think this happened to me? You have to uh, get confident enough to distance yourself from that. And uh, I do know that my next book is set in Bombay, so I think maybe I'm getting better. But I think it's always a worry, this, because in a, in a sense that all fiction is true and then it's not true. So, you know, where does it come from? Uh, I think, the that's, line that's is a, I think what you're talking about is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, sorry, uh, the difference between fact and truth which is also the difference between uh, narrative nonfiction and fiction. Absolutely Where agree. imagination Absolutely. comes into play. So I play. feel, so when people ask me if being a journalist helped with writing fiction, I feel absolutely not because the impulses of journalism are so different from the impulses mm. of fiction. Journalism is about fact, it's about detail, it's about underlining things. And I think good fiction is about leading readers by the hand to a place and leaving them there. You can't talk down to the reader, you can't underline, over explain, fill in details. So when I was editing my book, because it's, I had a chance to do that again for the UK edition, I think a lot of what I did was delete things. I didn't modify things, but it was a lot of deleting things because as a journalist, that's an impulse that I have. Fill detail, name, place, age, you know, so. Yeah, so I think fact versus truth is a good uh, is a good way to frame it. Uh, 
show me on that question of uh, the journalism. The line blurring eye is what you yeah. were the narrator and narrator the and the uh, author. And, and the author yes. yeah no i mean and the author as a journalist and the author well the narrator is not a journalist no no i mean the uh, the, the, the author you as a journalist well i uh, let me address the narrator okay. author uh, thing first because i think it's uh, extremely crucial and it's at the heart of the novel Absolutely. as well yeah i think it was a lot of uh, what i was doing or intended to do was uh, play a lot of postmodern games. So the uh, narrator is an orphan. The author is not. The narrator lives off a huge inheritance. The author doesn't. The narrator is a failed writer. The author would like to believe that he is not. The narrator, unlike the author, is not happily married at least after some distance into the book, and is a failed father, both of which the author would like to believe not applicable. <laughs> and it is anti-autobiographical in a way, because all the places where the narrator goes to get his stuff published and is rejected every single time are all the places where the author has been published. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's absolutely what I felt too, you know, because uh, Shomo and I have known each other for a long many, time, many, years, no? many, many years. Um, this business of journalism, sorry to come back to it as, as a f former journalist, I can't shake it off. We're all former journalists. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in some ways. Some, some more can, than <laughs> some others. Some more than others, yeah. Um, does being a journalist instill a habit that is relatively easy for being an author. And I say this because, you know, I mean, many, many, many years back, I did a PhD on Graham Greene, who was also a journalist uh, and an author. And sub-editor on the Times. Sub-editor on the Times. And, and he remained a, a journalist all his life. So he was reporting from... That's right. Um, Libya. Uh, uh, no, and, 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 and what eventually became Vietnam, yeah. uh, Indochina. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, and... Which is where Quiet American... The Quiet American, and he was also and spying. And of course, one and has to mention. Course. Yes, absolutely. So, um, but um, does that help? I mean, uh, does it instill a kind of uh, routine and a discipline um, that helps yeah. in being Yeah, since I just spoke about how it doesn't help, there's all that unlearning. The only area it does help is that we know deadlines because you know, newspapers go to press. So I feel I was like a model writer for my publishing house. I was following up on them on deadlines. I was one day ahead because uh, we at least know you have to finish a story. The paper has to go to press. And I think publishing houses aren't used to that. They are used to novelists saying, maybe next year sometime in spring, you'll get the first draft. So I think it definitely helps with discipline, with delivering things, with, and I think with editing your writing. Mm, I've also absolutely. been an editor, as absolutely. has Shomo. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that writing and editing um, utilize, they kind of light up very different parts of your brain, and they're both very important. Mm. And early on, when I started writing, uh, a writer I really admire had told me that you need to do these things also at separate times, so just mm. do free writing, free drafting for a week maybe, and then edit. Uh, because if you're mm. constantly self-editing, which is mm. a problem when you're a journalist, right? Mm. You want, uh, you're constantly self-editing, you can't really let go and, and, and just kind of flow on the page. But I think both aspects are extremely important to writing a work of full-length fiction. Uh, so being a journalist and an editor definitely helped with deadlines, discipline, and self-editing. And I think you need to be your own editor, no matter how great an editor you're working with. And I was lucky to work with, you know, Udayan Mitra at HarperCollins, who was, who was wonderful. Yes, um, yes, yes, um, yes, but very, very uh, the way that good, editing yeah. works differently in fiction and in journalism, I also realize that in journalism, we are more prescriptive with our edits. I will say, do this, fill this in, and I expect the writer to do that. And if they don't, it, it's sent back, right? Uh, so I was expecting those kind of edits. And then I realized Udayan's edits were very gentle. Mm -hmm. You know, have you thought about this? And, and I suggest. So ultimately, it's up to you. So I think that idea of self-editing is, is very important. And I, I do think that the faculty of journalism helped 
in that. He's a gentleman, isn't he? He's wonderful. I wish he was here. He'd yeah, know that we're just yeah, sitting Udayana here and very, praising very him. Yeah. Sure. No, I, yeah. I completely agree with uh, what Anita is saying. Um, I'll, since you were talking about Green, I'll come back to him. And what Green used to do, as you must know, but not everybody here may, is he would put down 500 words a day and then stop. Even if he were in the middle of a sentence, he would stop. Another example, of course, is Hemingway, who too was a journalist, who would always stop in the middle of a sentence so that he knew when he sat down the next day what he was going to pick up. So I think that is something that journalism teaches you, as uh, Anindita said, it's the rigor. Yeah. I mean, they're two completely different approaches, but uh, journalism teaches you the rigor to do it every day, no fuss, finish it. And of course, editing, self-editing, making it sharper, making it better, writing for cadence, writing for rhythm, writing for the ear, not just for the eye. Thanks. I think it's um, given that you know both novels are so luminously written, um, and, and the precision of words and, and the images, I was wondering if I could persuade you to read um, a bit from your novels. Uh, can I begin with you, Anandita? With, sure. Do you have uh, a specific yeah, section? Um, uh, I was hoping that you would read the section where uh, news arrives for Tara that, uh, uh, that Roby has died. Since you're such a well-prepared moderator, is it, is it marked <laughs> out here? Do you do yeah, that? I think the last one is probably, yeah, yes, uh, yeah, yes. The, I think it begins before. <clears throat> Okay, so this, uh, it's not a spoiler because the man who's died uh, dies on page one of the novel, but his daughter only finds out halfway through, so it's when she's just got the news. Um, Tara's first instinct was to look out from her balcony. There was the sky, the pagodas of the Dalai Lama temple rising in the distance, the big deodar spreading its limbs like men on public buses, the tea stall opposite the road, and even the pahari cow with colorful beads around her neck who parked herself there daily. The cycles chained in a row to a metal railing were not there. It was past nine now, and they had made their way into other streets and lanes, their destiny yoked to their owners. The world with its order and rhythm was in order. Only her father, older than her world, was gone. As children, Tara and Shurjo would laugh when they heard servants use the word expire for deceased relatives. Medicines and packaged foods expire. Can a human being finish his purpose, literally cease to be useful? As a child, she had found the misplaced usage funny. It seemed cruel now, but the democracy of death in the English language seemed unfair. A terrorist could be dead in an encounter, a rogue elephant could be shot dead, and now, her father, too, was just dead. In Indian tongues, a common criminal and her father would sway the verbs differently to conjugate. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you. That's a lovely passage. Uh, I'll just put a question to both of you on the back of that uh, particular passage and come back to you for a uh, reading, Shomo. So uh, you mentioned how uh, Indian languages would express some things differently. As both of you are Indian authors writing in English. Do you think your mother tongues and other tongues influence your imagination or sometimes push their way into your writing in English? Uh, so I have a master's in linguistics, so I feel my answer to yeah. this could be a whole session, but yeah. uh, it's so complicated. I was born in Calcutta. I speak Bengali at home, but I grew up in Bombay. So, of course, I speak Hindi, English, uh, a little bit of Marathi. I have a lot of Gujarati friends, so I understand Gujarati. I did my master's thesis on Tankhul Naga, which is a Northeast language. I studied Spanish at university. But the only language that I can write fiction in is English. And I'm often made, because now there's, you know, um, and it's a good thing there's such a focus on translation. We are celebrating writers and translation, but I'm often made to feel ashamed that I don't read in Bengali, but 
I'm a product of, you know, years of colonization. It's not my fault. I think my parents were being decent people by not forcing their child who's already studying English, Hindi and Marathi in school to also read in Bengali. I mean, that would be cruel. So, um, but while I can only write in Bengali, I do feel, yes, I do feel that my creative universe is so informed, uh, even like say from Gujarati music or, or you know, Marathi theater, right? All of that. And I'm definitely all the more richer for it. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a privilege uh, to have uh, those many different registers of language. Yeah. Shomu, what about you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think in English, obviously, but especially when I think about writing, but um, it is equally true that I am thoroughly bilingual. I love speaking in Bengali. Uh, I can read, I can write up to a reasonable, well, high level of proficiency. And uh, it informs my creative world to a large extent. I think the biggest example here is uh, Rai and the kind of renaissance man that he was, equally at home uh, with Hindustani classical music as with Beethoven, with Western literature as with Rovindranath. So I think uh, that that is a kind of model, uh, Bengali, that subsequent educated uh, so-called intellectual Bengalis have aspired to become. But what about the Probashi Bangalis? Because they had yeah, moved I, to Bombay and now also do no, Hindi true. and Marathi. No, that's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you picked up on that. But I'm so, Probashi uh, for the past 20 years as well. So, uh, 12 years Shobo in Bombay Probashi and then Delhi. born and Probashi become. Acquired. 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 Last it's 20 years of your life thing. was not Probashi. I'm, I'm born and raised in Bihar, so I, I completely... No, Probashi acquired has Gita a there. slightly fraudulent uh, thing about it. There's no I'm doubt. I'm glad you said it. Yeah, um, so Chomo, uh, would oh, you yeah. like to read uh, a oh, yeah. uh, section? But I completely agree with w what both of you said, uh, uh, because uh, I think, and there are some amazing sessions in this festival on translation uh, uh, um, and, and authors like Gitanjali Sri, I mean, who actually, you know, are equally proficient in English and Hindi and other languages. Yes. Uh, but I also want to add that, you know, your cultural um, kind of association with the language is not always necessarily from literature. So though, though I grew up in Bombay, I studied Rabindra Shongit for years. I sing in Bengali. I know at least 100 Tagore songs. And that's poetry. That's, that's also literature, right, in a way. So I feel we have to be less arrogant or and prescriptive. And straight jacketed. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I about everyone needs to, I don't know, write in their mother tongue, because uh, for some of us it was not possible and we should not be under this burden. No, absolutely. Of, uh, My daughter can't uh, write or speak in Bengali because uh, she grew up in Bombay and she was reading Hindi, French and English in school. So, just as you said, I mean, it would have been cruel to sort of impose it upon her. I tried once or twice during the summer holidays, never worked. She never required an interest in it. Although her spoken Bengali is absolutely flawless. As is mine, yes. <laughs> but uh, I think- I, I haven't spoken to you for long enough. <laughs> but, uh, but I think as Indians, most of us are so privileged just to mm. be multilingual, right? When yes. you speak to yeah. writers, say from the US or UK, they're just so envious of this idea. Yeah. So yeah. even if you speak two languages yeah. or, or three, uh, which many of us do, I think just that is also a privilege and we should be proud of it. And I think translanguaging, and again, as linguists, you sort of, uh, translanguaging configures your brain differently than from being just bilingual or, or you know, monolingual, of course, of course, but also bilingual where you are speaking either English or French. What we do in India, we tend to translanguage. We use all the languages we have almost simultaneously in conversations. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say one thing here. Also, there are, of course, certain words that are best expressed or relationships or, you know, nuances in one language over the other. And I think it's brilliant now that global publishing and I think especially the UK publishing scene, they are so supportive and celebratory of retaining your native words. I have 
Bengali words, Hindi words, Sanskrit words, and I actually thought they'd want me to do a glossary yes, for I, UK. But glossaries are very passe now, yeah, so yeah. thankfully I wouldn't want a glossary. I mean, it used to be, say, 15, 20 years ago. So Arundhati yeah. Roy's book had a yeah. glossary, yeah. right? Amitabh yeah. Ghosh's initial uh, novels. Uh, novels. Glossary. Sometimes yeah. you need it, I guess, if they're very technical words. But I was surprised, Devanjan, that there were more things I thought I wanted to explain because, say, something like a luchi, which is not a puri, which even maybe not all Indian readers would have understood because it's Bengali, but the joy of a luchi, which is a maida flatbread, mm. is so different from a puri, which is harder to eat and it doesn't bend in your fingers and it doesn't dip into the alu as well. So it had to be luchi, right? I was surprised that my UK editor... Oh, Look, food. So, food. Luchi this is Bengali. And, <laughs> and Shingara and Samosa and Fuchka and Golgappa, Bandai. all of these will elicit very so, similar responses. And I have Golgappa in the book as well, which I described as, I think, um, moon shaped puffed balls uh, that explode in your mouth, right? And that was important to me. But what I'm saying is, I was surprised that the UK editor didn't actually, they didn't need me to translate the words. There were things that I wanted to explain because maybe the journalism thing, you know. Uh, but so what we did was we retained the word and kind of explained it maybe two lines later, which was a good negotiation. But I found that very interesting because I thought that an international editor would just come with, what is this, what is this, what is this? But uh, this conversation about how we've done the work of even understanding Juno Diaz's world, mm. right? Or, or uh, Jonathan Franzen writing mm. about yeah. kind of the American wilderness. And I've had to Google so many bird terms and trekking terms because of Franzen's books that yeah. the West should do that work as well. And I think it's a wonderful trend that as writers of color, we are not expected to translate yes all the time yeah shomu could i uh, uh, yeah. request you to um, read a bit from your book i'll read a uh, brief excerpt and uh, but first i must uh, put it in context this is one of the turning points of the novel the narrator's marriage is collapsing. He lives off this huge inheritance, so he's never had to actually uh, work for a living. Money has been invested in the stock market and in equities, and the market has crashed. And on the one hand, while his marriage seems to be on shaky ground, he's waking up every morning feeling a little poorer. So it's at this time that they decide, the two of them, the husband and wife, and of course they take their daughter with them, to go on a ruinously expensive holiday that they can barely afford. They know they can't afford it, but they want to go just to see if they can save the marriage by going away on such a trip. So this is where we pick it up. And what I'll do is I'll skip bits, so bear with me because there'll be pauses. We threw money at the problem, your mother and I, and decided to go away on a holiday that we weren't sure we could afford. We brought out all the banal phrases. This will offer us a change of scene. We'll make a fresh start. We're going away to make it better. We'll bring things back on track along with swimsuits and new clothes and your floppy hat and books to take away with us. But going away is much overrated. It solves nothing if one is meant to return soon enough to where one had gone away from. We flew from Bombay to Barcelona and from there took a luxury cruise liner across the Western Mediterranean. The idea was to unmoor ourselves from the conflict that was beginning to disfigure our lives. And being at sea, we had hoped, would be a symbolic and literal representation of that. It was, in a way, 
Well, sort of. The sense of being adrift, floating, the sense of expansion and vastness in being engulfed by the sea that changed color and the dome of the sky that changed color too. While on the ship, the swimming pools roiled with people and the slatted floors of the pool decks were spattered with footprints, were cleaned and became spattered again. And the wind whipped us as we stood near the rails when approaching or leaving land and the casinos echoed with the jangling of money and the bars filled up with smoke and the sound of live music. The sense made us feel as though we were in a parallel universe, one that even the glossy brochures and the TV shows we had seen had not prepared us for. The places we visited herded off the ship, walking unsteadily along the springy gangway and stepping with relief onto the shore, remained with me less as concrete memories than as a blur of sensations. In Tunis, the White House with a red tiled roof at the end of a curving driveway lined by trees whose name I did not know. Our kitschy picture taking in Florence in front of the replica of the David, the ribbon of the Arno, filthier than I remembered from a previous occasion. Antipasti on the harbor front in Naples, the outline of a fort indistinct as the sky lowered and the rain swept in, and cypresses in Tuscany, Van Gogh's cypresses, I always call them, though of course he hadn't painted them in Italy. Squealingly, you meaning the daughter, of course, you were squealingly, relentlessly thrilled. And seeing you so happy, we appreciated more keenly what we had in you and what we shared. We bickered still in hissed, urgent tones after he had gone to bed. But it did seem as though something of that determination to hurt each other had dwindled. The edge of the bitterness and hostility with which we began and sustained our fights in Bombay had been blunted in this floating life on the Mediterranean. Thanks, uh, Shomo. We are being, um, I think, being warned about that we are running out of time here. Uh, do you think, uh, a quick question to the organizers, do, do we have time for a couple of questions to the audience? Yeah, I think there's a hand up right in front. Yeah. I wanted, my question was for Anindita Ghosh. I wanted to congratulate you for a sort of superbly crafted novel. It was harrowing when I was reading it. I have so many questions, but I'll try to distill them to just one. So the sort of central conceit of your book was grief mourning and loss, or one of the central conceits at least. It's a, the canvas is a variegated one. But I wanted to ask you, which is what made it so sort of draining for me. Uh, when you, the excerpt you read out also had that word expire, which I felt was an explicit, I don't know if it was an advertent uh, intertextual echo with Jhumpa Lahiri's namesake, when Ashok Ganguly dies and Oshima is filling out those library cards, she reads expire. And there have been other novels like Agni Doshi's and Bernadine Everisto's that have talked about the uh, mother-daughter dynamic and loss specifically. So were there uh, sort of classic or contemporary literary uh, sort of precursors, examples that you were drawing from to distill this theme into your novel? I have many other questions, but I'll stick to this one. Just to go to the start of your question, though, about the central conceit, I think... Uh, Obviously, since novelists are looking at, you know, a full-length work, they don't have an elevator pitch, so you don't start off with a central conceit. But through the writing of the book, uh, I thought my central conceit was actually the idea that two things can be true at the same time, and hence the mother and the daughter and their truths are also true at the same time, because they are thinking about the same man, but they have completely different ideas of who they are. Um, it's interesting you mentioned grief, I think, because the book was out during COVID. 
and all of us were battling or navigating grief and loss in some way, I think that became something that people really attached themselves to. Um, I hadn't thought I was writing a book about grief, but when I think about it now, since there's also so much desire in the book, and maybe that's also a dichotomy, right? Grief and desire, so maybe in some way it was about these two things being true at the same time. Um, I wasn't conscious of the namesake reference that you mentioned, but it makes so much sense now. I think things that you read stay in you and they might express themselves some way. Uh, but uh, there were other literary references that were overt. But then reviewers have pointed out other things that honestly writers don't overthink as much as I think readers and critics sometimes think they do. But it's wonderful when critics or readers point things out. So, you know, once the book is written, it's your book, it's the reader's book. So I love it when people come up with their own inferences. And I uh, really agree with uh, his observations. Because I didn't want to be the one saying that this reminded me of Jhumpa Lahiri. It also reminded me a lot of Rituparna Ghosh's films and narratives. I mean, the North Calcutta parts. Yeah, right? so... Uh, but um, questions for the from the audience. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, I began reading the novel thinking that it was a mother-daughter novel, also because that's what the blurb says. But when I read it, the characters that were most interesting for me were the ones that only make special appearances or cameos. Um, Tashi and Noor were very interesting for me, as was the woman who leads that feminist utopia, creates a state uh, for them. Do you also, at some level, think that it's about relationships that couldn't be? One with the man in Manipal because there was no respect, and uh, the other with the man in Dharamshala because he was partnered. Uh, that's how I read the novel. This, this is such a long answer to this question. I don't know if I can uh, take up all that time. Chintan's also an excellent journalist, you know, so I think his questions come. Uh, for me, um, the Dharamshala, Tashi, who is a Tibetan activist in Dharamshala, and his encounter with Tara happens, um, I mean, it happens after her encounter with Amitabh in Mysore, who's supposed to be like a not good guy. But the reader reads about the Tashi encounter first. And for me, I think it was almost meant to be like a foil. Like he behaves as a good man would, uh, which is why Amitabh's behavior, which you read about later in the novel. Um, and, and one of the things I was interested in is also not overt violence or overt humiliation or overt discrimination. I think we, we write about oppression, we write about patriarchy, but I was interested in the idea of privileged women and the, what they need to navigate, which is not, it's not always rape or domestic violence or, or not getting a chance to study. These are women with master's degrees, but they still feel stifled somehow. So because Amitabh's transgressions would not be clear to everyone, I think I wanted a man like Tashi to kind of just show that it's possible to be that person. Uh, so I think he was almost a foil, actually. That's a very interesting way of, because I was also intrigued by this particular um, kind of relationship, uh, set of relationships. Uh, may I uh, invite a question that's directed at Shomo from the audience before coming back to the authors for one last set of comments? Right. Sorry, no, uh, Pratiti said we have five more minutes. <laughs> So we'll come back to uh, uh, here, to both of you. Uh, Shomo, in, uh, towards the very end of the novel, um, there's a really poignant line where you say, bleep New India. New India made and unmade me. Both your novels are in some ways about the New India. So how would you respond to that? Shomo and then Anandit. No, I mean, uh, the relation that the so-called New India has, and this guy actually says, fuck New India. And there's no reason for us to be coy, we're all adults here. So um, the, the New India in the novel, my novel at least, the relation it has in how money and, in a sense, avarice and greed can finally trump and then break on its wheels 
a person who wanted to be nothing more and nothing less than a writer. So it's the, the kind of way in which he makes his living without having to do a jot of work other than failing to write and being a spectacular failure at it. I mean, it would not have been possible in the old India. Those avenues weren't open. But then look what happens. It turns around and bites you in the bum. Anitta, just twisting the same question about how easy, is it a bane or a boon to be a writer in New India? We were just having this conversation last night with a few writers in the audience. I think uh, because the right wing or say the, the people who might come up as a bane to any kind of writing, they don't actually read books, they read tweets. So you would be in far more trouble if you tweeted something very direct and overt, then write a whole book which is a veiled criticism of a regime because they don't actually read the books. So I think fiction yeah. and literary fiction especially possibly is a great way out and we should all be reading books and writing books instead of, and you know, kind of maybe even, um, I wouldn't say influence because that's not what you want to do as a fiction writer, but kind of getting under people's skins in more, in ways that would last longer and, and touch your, stay in your blood longer than just a quick social media post that gives you some kind of fame and glory and gets you arrested maybe for a day or something, but then it's forgotten. So I think fiction is great for New India because it's so indirect and the right wing doesn't read. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely brilliant being in conversation with... Thank you, uh, uh, with You were a really you. excellent moderator. Thank so. you, I blush. Um, uh, but uh, these are two brilliant authors with brilliant new books. So please go out there and buy them. And they will only sign the books if you buy them. So there is a stall at the back where they are selling books. Thank you. Thank you, Devan.